Okay, welcome everyone to the Center for Open Science webinar series. I am Brian Nosek, I'm Executive Director of the Center for Open Science. And also uh, uh, in the presentation uh, team today is Tim Arrington, who is Director of Research at Center for Open Science. This session is to provide uh, an overview of some new evidence that was recently published in Nature Human Behavior about registered reports and their association with uh, rigor uh, and uh, greater research quality. Uh, and then ideally, uh, we would like this to uh, evolve, devolve uh, into some discussion about what is it that we can, as a research community, do to further investigate registered reports and their potential value uh, for uh, advancing knowledge and accelerating progress in science. We will uh, encourage you to raise your hand uh, at any time uh, if you have questions that you would like to address. Uh, just use the raise hand feature in Zoom uh, and we can uh, enable your microphone uh, to be able to speak uh, in this context. And, uh, uh, and we will have some break points uh, during the uh, slides uh, and then uh, discussion time at the end uh, to really try to flesh out where we stand with registered reports and what comes next. So Tim, you can uh, begin the slide deck uh, and then uh, I will give a couple of minutes of stage setting and then Tim will present uh, the key new results. So the uh, work uh, that we will present was supported by the James McDonald Foundation primarily and Arnold Ventures provided some additional support. What we wanna do uh, first is provide some context uh, for registered reports for those that are less familiar or with the, what current evidence there is. So next slide. Uh, this is the cartoon version of how research gets done, right? You develop an idea, you design a study, you collect and analyze data, you write the report and then you publish the report. But of course, in the standard model, there is a big barrier after writing the report before it's published and that is peer review. And in this context, all of the incentives for researchers to get through peer review, to get their goal of getting a publication are to have outcomes uh, that are innovative, novel, exciting, uh, and create a neat and tidy story so that the paper is understood to be advancing knowledge and being innovative and creating something new uh, that hasn't been seen before. But of course, as is the discussion across many uh, meta research and other kinds of commentaries and investigations, that kind of incentive structure can create troubles uh, for the credibility uh, of the research uh, that is produced at the end, and particularly in publication bias, favoring positive results over reporting of negative results. So the key innovation of registered reports is to add an additional peer review process earlier in the process, after the design phase, before one has looked at or even collected the data. And by adding peer review here, what happens in registered reports is that one, the authors get feedback on their research designs before conducting them. So they actually might be able to revise them in the context of uh, how they will investigate their research questions. But more importantly, the journal makes a pre-commitment to publishing the results of the research as long as the authors follow through with what they say they were going to do, uh, regardless of what the outcomes are. And so the presumption of registered reports is that it will reduce or entirely eliminate publication bias based on the outcomes because the outcomes aren't known at this stage. And then when peer review occurs after writing the report, that stage of peer review is not about are the outcomes what we expected or are they exciting enough? Rather, the, the evaluation is about did the authors do what they said they were going to do? And did they interpret their results responsibly? So the existing evidence uh, that has been uh, accumulated with registered reports in practice finds that it is effective at this primary criterion. That primary criterion being, does it allow, enable, encourage negative results to be published? And does it eliminate that bias against publishing them? And here are two different investigations, Alan and Meller and Scheele et al, uh, that looked at this in slightly different ways uh, comparing registered reports with articles published in the same journal or similar journals around the same time. 
And what you see just referring to the uh, example of the data on the right uh, is that in standard reports, almost all of the hypothesized uh, findings were obtained. So papers are almost perfectly successful at finding evidence in favor of their hypothesis. Whereas with registered reports, when no one knows what the outcome is going to be, uh, more than half of the studies uh, found lack of support uh, for their initial hypothesis. A similar type of approach on the right uh, showing negative results uh, are much more prevalent in registered reports, whether they are replication studies or novel studies compared to the traditional, the standard model of evaluating research. So this is key evidence about the primary criterion for registered reports in how it addresses uh, potential credibility issues in the published literature. Another line of work tried to look at what's the, whether there's implications in terms of how researchers respond to registered reports. For example, by, are they less likely to cite registered reports because uh, they are more boring, more likely to report uh, negative evidence. And the investigations that have been done to date suggest that there isn't a difference or even there might be a slight favorability to register reports in the attention that they get through citation uh, compared to uh, other articles published in the same journals around the same time. And so this is just one display uh, showing that there's very little difference uh, between the likelihood of citation on average for a registered report compared to similar articles. So that's some of the, and there's other investigations, that's some of the key uh, findings to date about registered reports. The context of the present uh, study that we would like to summarize is wondering if this review prior to knowing the outcomes changes the actual rigor and quality of the research itself. And there are a couple of possible mechanisms one could imagine for that. If I, have, as an author, know that I'm being peer reviewed based on the importance of my research question, the quality of my methodology to test that question, and I don't have results yet, then my attention as an author will be more on the importance of the question and the quality of the methodology. So I make work harder uh, in making those more rigorous, more robust in order to get through peer review. And a second possible factor is that as a reviewer, when I'm evaluating a registered report, then I might be able to see flaws and provide feedback that instead of the authors just being frustrated, oh, I wish we had thought of that before we did the research in the standard model, in a registered report model, that feedback can potentially be incorporated into the design and improve the overall rigor and quality of the research. So there's good baseline reasons to expect that rigor and quality may actually be improved in registered reports. And so the current study uh, was designed to test that. So I'll hand it over now uh, to Tim to take us through the research. All right, thank you, Brian. So let me give a bit of a background into what we were doing in our research um, on this, this recent paper. So one thing that we did, which is what some of the evidence that Brian was just summarizing beforehand, is we used the existing literature, published, already published registered reports to kind of investigate this question. Um, so at the time when we began the study, preparing the study materials, uh, there were 116 identified registered reports, um, of which we only used 29. That's because we were excluding replication studies. Uh, we wanted to look at novel research, um, largely just because that's what's more prevalent in uh, the traditional literature, at least how it's traditionally published. Um, and we also, by looking at the scope of the disciplines that it was covering, we, we went to the majority, which was psychology and neuroscience. That left us with 29 registered reports at the time. One of the very first things that we wanted to do is just to identify what those comparison articles were, at least from the peer review standpoint. And so uh, as we outlined in the paper, there's two main areas that we decided to focus on. One was the author, and the other one was the journal that it was published in. Um, and in both of those, what we wanted to do is to match, not just on the journal, but also trying to focus in on the topic um, and the year or the, this time span it was published, right? So all of these are, are relatively close to each other within a year of the publication of the registered report in an attempt to try to find similar research um, published at a similar time uh, and focusing again on these two key aspects. And then what we wanted to do in terms of investigating this was to be able to have it essentially reviewed again. And that was a lot of really fun discussion about, well, what's the best way to do this? And what we landed on was, was peer reviews, right? Is using peer review, just like we, we 
review journal articles, just like we review um, funding calls. Um, we thought that that would be the best way. And we actually mirrored that in terms of the different criteria, the different questions that we were gonna have the reviewers um, investigate. So let me let me walk you through a little bit more for those um, uh, who maybe didn't read uh, all the supplemental information of the paper. Um, kind of how we did this, especially in terms of how we match those reviewers to articles, because we didn't actually do that. We actually had them self-select into the process. Um, so we started with uh, first having them identify. So these are reviewers that we identified um, that were active researchers, largely in the United States was at the majority of our sample, um, but we also did do some researchers that were active in um, the EU. But we first, uh, when we invited them into taking our survey, we had them self-select into, well, what was the research and academic field that I associate with based on my experience? Uh, so, right, is it cognitive psychology versus um, social psychology or, or a subset? Um, and it might be that there's none of those. And in that case, they would, they would self-exclude themselves out of the survey because we wanted to have this kind of assignment to um, your own uh, expertise. After they identified which uh, area they were in, they would then see keywords that were matched to the registered report and the comparison articles. So essentially, once again, they get presented with a screen to let them identify with their expertise, which one most closely matched it. And if none of them matched it, if they came into this saying, I'm a cognitive psychologist, but none of those keywords fit my area, they could select none and be um, removed from, from taking the survey. We wanted to do that because of the association of being able to have an individual self-identify not by the article, but by features of the discipline and the keywords that are associated with the research, what's the best expertise that they can have. Once they went through that, as I said, the keywords are brought, each table, each row of keywords comes from the registered report and those comparison articles I was talking about. At the moment that they enter the survey, they're randomly assigned to a registered report, the one associated with the keywords and one of the two comparison articles that we were just describing, either the journal or the author. So that was a random event. They were also then randomly assigned to which one they'd evaluate first. Um, was it the registered report or would it be the comparison article? So that's another random randomization that we built into the design. Then when the authors were gonna review their very first article, right? Either one of those two, we also treated it similar to how uh, grant articles and the registered reports model is, which is asking questions before those results are known. So we'd first break out the introduction and the methods um, and the results of everything except for that last study that's in the article, the one that was being um, registered in the, in the registered report. So there were eight questions there. Then we'd show them the results in the discussion of that last study. So there'd be seven more questions. So now they see those results. And then we'd show them the abstract at the very end, let them ask questions about the entire paper uh, uh, globally. And there were four additional questions there. And then they'd, like I said, they'd repeat it for the other article. All right, so let me go through um, and I'll go over kind of the main findings and I'll take a break and pause and see if there's any uh, questions. So this is the main figure that we uh, presented in our article. And what you see here, this is just of the uh, introduction and the methods. Um, and these are the posterior probability distributions for the parameter estimates. And this is looking at the within subject design. So taking into account um, both, both studies that were going on. Uh, and what we see here is the black horizontal line. You guys can see my cursor. There's a dot that's the mean. And then the dark black in each one is the 80% uh, credible intervals. And then the light line that goes past it is the 95% uh, credible intervals for each one of these. And we ordered them, right, as you can see here, from which one would have the highest performance advantage for registry reports. So what's on the right versus the ones that would have the least uh, performance advantage for registered reports. So again, if it's on the left side of zero, that means that the comparative article has a higher performance advantage. Um, so what we see here in these very first ones, right, this is before learning about those that findings of the last study um, compared to the controlled articles that reviewers evaluated the registry reports last study as having a more rigorous methodology, higher quality methodology, higher estimates of what would be learned, uh, higher quality research question, um, whether those research questions aligned with the um, uh, methodology, uh, the quality, uh, sorry, the importance of the research question, regardless of whether the results would be observed, the creativity of the methods, and the novelty of the research question. And again, anytime that we're spanning that zero, uh, it indicates that um, it's not statistically significant, um, or at least not, not statistically different from the uh, confidence intervals from the comparison article. So after we had the participants read then the results in discussion, 
right? So at this point, now they've seen the intro with the methods and now they get to see the results in the discussion. Uh, they also compared to controlled articles, we saw registered reports um, having a more rigorous analysis strategy, more justified conclusions based on the results, higher quality of the results, higher quality of the discussion, higher estimates of what would be learned, um, and more innovative results and more important findings, again, compared to those non-registered report articles. And I'll go, just go through the last one, the last section there, um, which is when after they finish the paper and they're presented with the abstract, um, compared to those control articles, they evaluated those registry reports as having higher overall quality, producing more important discoveries, better alignment between abstract and findings, and more likely to inspire new research. So in aggregate, between all of these, what we saw is that registry reports did outperform these comparison articles on all 19 criteria. Um, and reviewers, basically, they were rating these registry reports as either similar, right, or more positively than the non-registry report com uh, comparison articles. Um, which, of course, we were really interested to see. Uh, um, and just a note, I'm not showing you here, this was the within comparison, as I mentioned, because we randomized, we could also do a between subject comparison. So just looking at the very first article someone rated, um, and we saw similar results as well, but it allowed us to investigate this a little bit uh, further and uh, the robustness of the findings. We'll go one more slide and then we'll take a pause. We also, um, our colleagues coded the objective features of the articles. So again, this is now just at the article level. Um, and, and here's a summary of some of these open behaviors that we found. Um, so the, again, of the 29 registered reports in the, the mapped journal and author-based comparisons, we found that there were more open materials and data and pre-registration compared to registered reports. The pre-registration is actually an interesting one to call out, um, only in the sense that we would expect it to be 100%, right? These are registered reports. So this shows us that there's still improvement. And at the time, we actually, some have, have published on the need for that improvement of just making those pre-registrations discoverable. There's a, a couple of great articles that, that highlight that, and this reinforces that finding. Um, the other thing that's worth calling out is that the sample size of these studies were also larger on average um, than compared to the comparison articles. Uh, so again, showing you, I think, a lot of the kind of uh, objective features that we'd expect in, in more open um, and, and, and uh, rigorous and reproducible articles. So this was actually a really nice finding to have, even if the sample size is relatively small. Okay, I'm going to pause here. Actually, I'll start here just in case there's any questions. I'm going to hand it back over to Brian, but I want to see if there's if there's any questions about um, what we've sh shared to date so far. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can just raise your hand and we can uh, let you ask uh, your question about the findings as they are. Okay, well, you should feel free anytime uh, to raise your hands. I will continue uh, with a couple of final slides and implications, and then we'll transition to hopefully some discussion about next steps uh, in this. There were, uh, oh, you, we do have a question. Uh, so let me take that. Were the reviewers blinded to whether an article was a registered report or not? Well, excellent question. Uh, there were partially blinded in the sense that we removed mention of registered reports uh, from uh, the articles if it said something like registered report. But it is actually very difficult to blind in total in this context because there's a lot of factors that are associated with registered reports in behaviors that are also factors in evaluating the methodology. And so what we opted to do in this context was just remove explicit mentions of registered reports, but otherwise leave the papers relatively untouched. And so this creates an interesting situation of it's possible, conceivable, and in fact, half of the time authors could detect when we asked afterwards, was this a registered report or not? They were able to say accurately that whether it was a registered report, or whether it wasn't a registered report. So the so it, there is information there that the reviewers are drawing on to help identify uh, whether the papers are registered reports. So then an obvious question is, well, what's the implications of that, right? If, if authors know that, does it affect their assessment in a way that is different than what their assessment should be? And so what you're seeing on this figure is actually an evaluation of that question, or at least one part of the evaluation. What this is, is it's the 19 different uh, criteria, outcome criteria that were evaluated. And then in the rows, 
are the, uh, the reviewer's ratings of whether they thought registered reports would improve the quality of research compared to the standard articles. Substantially more means those that rated said, yes, I think registered reports would improve quality substantially more. Down to neutral, no, I don't th see, think there's any difference. And then the bottom there is negative. No, actually, I think registered reports will make things worse uh, in quality uh, compared to standard articles. There's only one category for negative uh, because very few people uh, articulated that belief. And so what this is is five bins or six bins, pardon me, uh, of uh, aggregating participants to be able to estimate whether there's a trend, a moderation by beliefs about registered reports to their evaluations of these particular articles on these criteria. And what you can see in the aggregate, if you're just sort of looking at the figure holistically, is that there is a trend, I'll go the other way, right? A trend uh, from larger effects for those that believed registered reports in get more quality to smaller effects for those that are more neutral or even negative about registered reports compared to others. So there is some moderation observed based on the beliefs of re reviewers about the quality of registered reports. A second thing to notice is that none of the estimates move substantially in the other direction, even among those authors or on, on those reviewers that believed uh, that register reports actually might reduce quality of research. For them, many of those credible intervals overlapped with zero, meaning that the true estimate uh, could be negative, but the, the preponderance of evidence leans still positive two credible intervals that were relatively uh, to the right, still favoring registered reports, even among that skeptical group. So there's both pieces of evidence here that beliefs about registered reports do matter for how re uh, reviewers evaluated the, these articles and that registered reports still show favorability even among uh, the most skeptical, uh, just much less so uh, across the various criteria. So this then requires some thought and unpacking about how we interpret this. So the next slide, please. Uh, there are a couple of particular interest, areas of interest to think about what does it mean that we see this moderation? Is it a demand effect, meaning that there's something uh, undesirable uh, about this uh, moderation? Or are we seeing something about real evaluations? So a few thoughts about this, and then this might be a good area for discussion. The first is that peer review itself and assessments of quality is subjective. So there is not in this context, an objective sense of is this higher quality or not? It is peer reviewers read a paper. They decide based on the qualities of the paper, the things, the features of the methodology, whether they rate that as higher quality or not. And so in that context, peer reviewers look at a lot of things. For example, if peer reviewers uh, see that there is random assignment in one paper and don't see random assignment in the other paper and rate the paper with random assignment as higher quality on methodology, then we would say, yeah, you, they, they have a belief about random assignment that leads them to evaluate that research as being higher quality. So blinding random assignment in that context to get a fair comparison doesn't make sense because it is the subjective assessment of the feet that feature that is informing the judgment. So in that sense, it's a natural evaluation. If you believe that features of registered reports lead to higher quality, then you would expect perception of registered reports to be associated with higher quality. However, there is a big concern in psychological research about demand effects that go beyond that natural evaluation. And, that, and just to take the, register, uh, the random assignment as an example, if I have a belief that random assignment is a higher quality thing to do, all else being equal in research, then what if I see random assignment and then say, well, I have that belief and uh, I, I, you know, there, then there are two potential negative effects. The, Experimenters may also have that belief. So they may want me to say, right, random assignment's really good. So I may artificially adjust my evaluations because of what the experimenter wants. But I also may artificially adjust all of my evaluations because of what I want. 
well, I'm a supporter of registered reports. I see that this is a registered reports. So I'm going to say that it looks more rigorous or the question is just as interesting or novel because of my belief in registered reports rather than because evaluating the question leads me to think that it is of higher quality. Those are very hard things to separate, right? Because ultimately what we need is some kind of insight into the reasoning process for that subjective assessment. How much is how I'm naturally evaluating based on my beliefs about that feature and how much is it an artificial adjustment away from that in order to ideologically, for example, bolster my belief uh, in that. We can't eliminate that issue entirely. And in fact, there's a rich psychological literature finding that it is not possible to effectively eliminate that entirely. Uh, but we can uh, find ways to address it to some degree. So for example, Tim mentioned that the findings are consistent whether you do a within subjects or a between subjects analysis. This does reduce the concern about demand effects to some degree in the between subjects analysis for the following reason. For it to be an artificial adjustment where I recognize that this is a registered report and then I come up with a mental decision matrix of, oh, I like registered reports and so I want to adjust my evaluation of this registered report and so I want to rate it more highly. There's a lot of noticing that has to occur and then deliberate adjustment uh, in my process as a reviewer. And in between subjects, I haven't yet seen both conditions. So when I'm in the condition where the standard article is first, I'm just reading an article like I usually do. It's not likely I'm thinking about registered reports in particular, unless I've been cued to that for my participation in the study. And so there isn't a lot of effect likely uh, on me adjusting unusually my ratings of these different factors. If I'm in the registered report condition first, one, I may not really notice the registered reports until I see a comparison, right? That may be more likely in the within subject. But even if I did, I don't have a benchmark to adjust against. I'm just like, well, I'm, oh yeah, this is a registered report and I'm making my ratings. And so I don't necessarily uh, have a comparative element of adjusting one up and the other down by comparison. When you do direct comparative judgments, here's a registered report and here is the standard report, which one is better on that dimension? That's where you maximize the likelihood of people invoking their demand or ideological adjustment. Well, I wanna like registered reports, so I'm gonna push that one up. Uh, but by separating in time and just comparing the things that people got first, we can reduce that to some degree. But again, it doesn't eliminate it. There's always the possibility that people are over adjusting based on what they would naturally evaluate subjectively. So the ideal would be if we could have objective measures of quality, right? No, let's get rid of all this subjective evaluation. Let's objectively decide how, how much quality random assignment is, how much quality uh, data sharing is, how much more quality is this feature of rigor. Now, obviously that's hard because they're, they're not, they're, they don't translate objectively uh, very well. Uh, so the closest that we probably can get in a program of research trying to understand uh, rigor and quality of register reports or other kinds of methods uh, is to evaluate things like robustness, reproducibility, replicability, right? Those outcomes that one can observe in a quantitative basis of here are the findings reported through register reports, here are the findings reported through standard reports. Are the effect sizes overestimated on average when you try to repeat them? Uh, are the effects more fragile in the context of a standard report versus one uh, that's a registered report, et cetera, et cetera. So those will be the areas uh, to continue to poke at and pursue on trying to understand uh, this phenomenon. Uh, before I go into some of the more extended things, why don't I pause there and see if there's uh, other questions that people want to raise? Um, there are. Yeah, there's a couple more questions there. I think we can we can take a pause and, and answer them. Um, so there's a one in particular, if we go back before we get, I think, into where you were going, Brian, because there's a question on that. Um, there are some questions about the pre back the pre-registration not being prevalent within registered reports. I think that's a good one. Um, and it 
so somebody was Emma was asking if there was a pre-registration that did not mean the stage one registry report wasn't available somewhere. There's I'm going to put in the chat. There's two articles that are worth reading. Remember, these are older papers. This is actually that issue has been described very well. Um, uh, Tom Hardwick did a great paper um, mapping the universe of registry reports. It's in Nature Human Behavior um, that basically outlined this exact issue that not all registry reports at the time were making that stage one acceptance available, right? That, that essentially being the pre-registration was not available. So what that meant is it was very idiosyncratic to like, oh, was a journal or an author doing it or not? There's also, I attached another article, which is a response by, by David Meller at Center for Open Science and um, uh, Chris um, Chambers basically saying, thank you. <laughs> yes, let's do that. It's vital. Like, let's improve the process and make sure that it's available. And so now we have a better system to make sure that those stage ones are available um, going forward. So again, I think this is exactly why we want this type of research just to keep improving, even something that's as, as simple as um, the ability of, of uh, making sure it follows process uh, in terms of the materials. So I think that's a, a great question. That's I defer to those articles as a great example of where to go. Um, and I think that also hopefully um, explains a little bit of a question about like pre-registration versus registered reports, um, right? Like the stage one is, is in essence the pre-registration, but you're right, if it's not available, then you're kind of left with, well, how do I even know? Um, so hopefully that answered that question. I thought that was a really good one. There's another one uh, I thought maybe we jumped to before we get into it, which was, uh, Brian, maybe I'll let you take this just because I think I think you asked me about it. So I'm guessing you already had a question similar to this, which is why wasn't this article published as a registered report um, or an exploratory report? But the registered report is one that's that's a great question because we tried. <laughs> yeah, very good question. Uh, the We did submit this particular study as a registered report uh, and it ended up getting rejected, but not entirely. They did say if you wanted to revise uh, and resubmit, you could, uh, but it was rejected on the basis of being too exploratory. Uh, we framed it as a set of questions and a variety of outcomes, and we wanted to report all outcomes because we didn't have a strong uh, theory uh, to test other than the question of, we presume, based on some general evidence, uh, that registered reports may show some performance advantages. Uh, but we didn't then pursue a, um, a revision uh, because of timeline. So one of the practical challenges of uh, registered reports is where the time is spent uh, on getting peer review and the commitment uh, to publication. And in this particular context, we were put, put this is a grant funded work that had a particular timeline where we needed to do the data collection. And by the time we got those reviews in, we thought it was too much risk based on our grant commitments uh, to then go back through the peer review process again before we started data collection. So we went ahead with data collection uh, and then published it as a, as a standard article. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if in the future we can vary that. Uh, I see some uh, additional comments that I want to tackle now. Priya uh, raises a great comment. Uh, she says, what about the uh, reverse experiment? Everything else about the study is the same, but one is explicitly a registered report and one isn't. Uh, this is a nice way to look at demand effects uh, in uh, trying to equate everything except the particular feature uh, of it being a registered report to see if people adjust based on their just general belief. Oh, it is a registered report, therefore it must be better. Uh, so it, that would be a great study to do. Uh, the key would be how do you, which parts get built into the being the same and which so that the just saying it's a registered report or not is the, the difference uh, of interest. For example, uh, would the control article also be pre-registered? Would the control article also have received comments from external reviewers, just not through a formal uh, publication process as a registered report or not? Because if authors or if the reviewers uh, are saying, I believe registered reports are higher quality, because I believe that they've been evaluated uh, by ex independent reviewers uh, prior to doing the research, then eliminating that feature would mean that the basis of their subjective assessment, why they believe that's of higher rigor, uh, is getting removed. But then you can start to unpack and say, well, hang on a second. If that's the basis of the belief, then it isn't really anything about the content of the report itself. It's not about their sampling design or uh, any other feature of the rigor. It's their belief about the process that generated this. 
And then we start to just get into the really complicated part of subjective assessment, right? Which parts of these really are where rigor comes. Uh, but Priya's example uh, would be a great additional study uh, to start to zero in on evidence. Tim, do you have something? You yeah, want to hang on, and I'm, I'm see if I can find it. Somebody's done that study, or at least they attempted oh, really? to do it. Yeah, I'll have to find it again. They pre-registered theirs, and I believe now it's been published. But the reason that they can't, the reason we don't talk about it, is because they, the manipulation check that they had in there about making sure that somebody could could understand if it was a registry report, because that's actually part of it, right? You're flipping the questions. So you have to be able to pick up the fact that it was indeed a registry report. Um, didn't happen. <laughs> So, so they did that as a registered report. Um, it, they really can't interpret their results very well because basically they weren't able to create that manipulation that they were intending to do, which is what you described, Priya. Uh, yet they still published it. So I'll, I'll find it if I can real quick to see if I can put it in the chat. If not, I'll add it to the notes because it's a really interesting um, study. And I would think that also that's a good benefit of, of registered reports, which is even though it still ended up being a uh, hard to interpret finding from a study, it's discoverable. Um, so I'm going to make it my job to see if I can quickly, quickly find it. Because I do remember this one because I've looked it up myself. I was excited to see the results. And I was I felt bad for them when it, it turned out that, that the large study that they did didn't pan out. Cool. Great. Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, Patricio uh, asks a question also. It says, it seems that pre-registration is not necessary for register reports. Or am I missing something? Uh, depends on what you mean. Um, it is built into the registered report process in the sense that the researcher, the authors have to make a commitment to their design and their analysis plan and what they will report prior to uh, observing the outcomes. And so that stage one commitment is a pre-registration in that form. And at stage two, the reviewers are evaluating the extent to which they adhered to uh, the state, their stage one pre-commitments. But pre-registration is, as a term, can also include mean that pushing that content into an independent registry. And that part is not required, right? It could all just be managed privately at the journal uh, and not have it be posted to an independent registry. From the position of the Center for Open Science, we think, oh, no, we, we want that to be public. <laughs> that part shouldn't be private uh, in the uh, registered report workflow at the journal. Uh, any reader should be able to look at the registered report, final report, and compare it with what the commitment was, uh, rather than just rely on the reviewers to do it. So we consider when Tim pointed out that that wasn't 100%, and we think it should be, that's really sort of an organizational commitment. No, if we're going to adopt these, we really want to try to promote 100% uh, adherence to making those stage one reports public to really maximize the value of registered reports. But, but the point is good in that it's not incumbent on the design of this uh, that that occur. Uh, let's see the uh, oh and the related question stage one protocol availability rate has improved but still not perfect. 50% uh, of journals require transparency in 2018 87% in 2020. Yeah, this is still moving uh, in the direction of uh, getting these protocols to be more transparently accessible uh, over time. So thank you for that uh, comment as well. Uh, Tim, are there any others that you want to answer now before we go on to the next part? No, I think that's great. Um, I did find that article real quick, uh, and I answered it to Priya's question because Priya, they wanted to answer it. So for those, I think this is great. Um, this will get us to kind of what are the next experiments and, and where's the direction research should go. But there's a paper um, there that was published um, last year in Royal Society that that was attempting to do what what Priya's uh, question is. So, so sharing that for everyone else uh, for awareness. Great, thank you, Tim. All right, you can go to the next slide. We'll have a couple of uh, additional comments about sort of next steps of how we can move uh, forward through some of these issues. Uh, and then uh, would really love the engagement and ideas uh, that you generate as a consequence of this as well. Uh, the first one here is what we were just discussing, uh, whether there is objective assessment of quality improvement that can be done and certainly using external standards. Someone in the questions and answers mentioned the equator guidelines. There are a number of these where they, if, if not uh, uh, entirely objective, they're at least uh, consensus-based uh, factors that are seen as being associated with higher quality. 
and using some standards like Equator and other uh, uh, reporting standards might be a mechanism of doing that. At least they're disclosing these things in addition to doing things like study uh, the reproducibility or robustness of the actual findings uh, as an indicator of quality. But this will always be in the area of uncertainty uh, and opportunity to sort of really keep pushing the boundaries on evaluating research quality more generally. A second obvious next step uh, for this area of research is to start to look more for the boundary conditions uh, of the benefits of registered reports. We were frankly surprised at the extent to which uh, the estimates were all to the favoring side of registered reports across these various criteria. We deliberately selected ones that have been offered as, to me, very plausible ones uh, that would favor standard reports over registered reports, such as creativity or novelty uh, or uh, importance of the findings themselves. Uh, with the expectation that part of really understanding and unpacking these data would be to start to look at trade-offs. Where is it that you would choose to do register report? Where is it that you would choose not to? And what's the right admixture of those uh, in the research literature to really promote the most robust research possible? The fact that we observed slight uh, to relatively strong favoritism for register reports across all of those criteria make some of that discussion more complicated. Are we saying now register reports should be how all research is done? That would be premature. But what is the, I think these, this evidence demands is that we start poking at that. Where is it that we will see that register reports continue to provide value similar to or greater than in terms of quality standard models? And where is it that the reverse will occur? Because it must be the case that in some scenarios, uh, that the benefits of registered reports would not be realized. And that could be by disciplinary fields. We only sampled a small number of disciplines here that had, uh, and the initial, in fact, the, the very first registered reports that came through those disciplines. And it started in a relatively narrow set of methodologies uh, that are used across the sciences. And so it could be that as registered reports becomes more common across disciplinary and methodological approaches, that its benefits become more diffuse or even counterproductive in some uh, circumstances. Likewise, as register reports becomes more pop popular, it is going to be less about those early adopters that may be unique uh, in how it is they approach register reports because it was a new thing, because they wanted to try this new innovation, and now more of standard practice. And as we've seen in lots of areas of intervention or implementation science, the initial implementation can often show much larger effects than the implementation effectiveness as it gets diffused across uh, the population and into the mainstream for a variety of different reasons. Uh, quality of implementation, uh, how it is that people approach it, uh, you know, unusual use cases that occur uh, in how the, the model gets used. Uh, so that's going to be a really important part of continuing to evaluate uh, registered reports. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that is an obvious one to try to do uh, is do it as a randomized trial. This was an observational study. We did our best to try to do matching in order to make it so that we could make an inference about it, registered reports being uniquely associated. So the matching by author and matching by journal is intended to do a lot, take care of a lot of the uh, obvious confounding influences right? Different authors, well, mostly took care of that. Uh, oh, different topics, oh, mostly kept it the same. Oh, different evaluation criteria by journal, well, matched by journal too. Uh, but it doesn't resolve all possible uh, confounding influences. And that's a, you know, a limitation of any uh, observational research. So it would be fantastic to get a randomized trial uh, that is a realistic uh, kind of randomized trial for registered reports. And it's hard to think about how to do this in a realistic way that isolates the right variables of interest, right? You could imagine doing a randomized trial where you say, okay, labs, you're gonna volunteer. And if you're selected into the treatment arm, then you're gonna do all of your research as registered reports for the next year. And if you're in the control arm, your lab's gonna do all research the normal way. It's not a very plausible design uh, to pursue. What we thought is the most likely plausible next step uh, for evaluating registered reports as a randomized trial is to take advantage of a feature 
that occurs in the peer review process itself, relatively naturalistically. And that is in a variety of uh, subfields of different uh, research areas or different disciplines, it is not uncommon to ask for an additional experiment in a revise and resubmit. So the reviews come in, the editor says, there's a lot to like here, but there's some evidence that really needs either reinforcement or that's missing, or you need to test this uh, particular condition because we're not quite convinced by the evidence. If you could design a new experiment uh, then and resubmit the paper, then we'll consider uh, it again for publication. That's a perfect time uh, for randomizing registered reports, right? So in the, in the model of this, uh, this approach, what would be, what would occur is if uh, the editor is going to ask for another experiment in the action letter, that's when the authors are randomized to be invited uh, or are invited into the study, if they agree to be in the study, are randomized uh, to standard treatment or registered report. Standard treatment would just be there, get their action letter like they normally do. Registered report what would be, we want you to do another experiment. What we want you to do is submit the experimental design back to the journal beforehand, and then we'll make the pre-commitment, right? It follows the register report model, and then everything else follows the same. Uh, this would uh, mimic a lot of features of uh, the natural process and allow a, a randomized trial that could be very useful. So there may be other innovations uh, to pursue as well, but that's one that we hope uh, can get funded at some point. And there's a number of different journals that are willing to participate uh, in that model uh, to really help push the boundaries of understanding uh, for registered reports. The next slide. One other um, important uh, innovation that registered reports enables uh, and that deserves some additional scrutiny and evaluation is whether the registered report model can really help to facilitate alignment of incentives and, and culture uh, change approaches between different stakeholder groups and particularly between funders and journals. Because the registered report model is a lot like applying for a grant, a joint approach between journals and funders provides an amazing opportunity to create a simplified review process and align the incentives between journals and funders. So the idea of a partnership here is that authors submit their registered report proposal, stage one proposal, and get it peer reviewed uh, with a budget attached. And if it makes it through that peer review process, the journal commits to publishing it, the funder commits to funding it, and everybody wins in this process. Authors say, what, I submit one time and I get the money and the publication? Sounds great. Journals say, oh, we get high quality research coming to our journal? Yeah, we're a game. Funders say, oh, everything that I fund uh, will get published ultimately if they can follow through with the work. That's a much better return on investment than I normally get, which is so much of the fun things that we fund never get reported at all. So it is easy to make the case for those various stakeholders about the potential value for this. The other thing that it may do uh, is actually facilitate culture change by making it much more visible that there are different stakeholder groups uh, that are all aligned on trying to promote greater rigor, transparency, pre-registration, all the things that come along uh, with registered reports. And so there are a number of funders that are, uh, have already uh, done this model as a pilot uh, and who are planning to do some in the next couple of years. And in fact, uh, we got a grant uh, through a National Science Foundation that's linked at the bottom of this slide to do an evaluation of these interventions uh, with these funder partners that are noted uh, for whether their uh, intervention in partnering with journals to offer this uh, actually helps to facilitate culture change within their uh, the research communities that they're trying to support. So there's a lot of interesting potentials, both on register reports for its own sake and getting stakeholders promoting register reports for culture change initiatives more broadly. Next slide. Okay, so that's it for highlighting uh, some of the in, uh, next things that are in the, in the mix uh, for registered reports. Uh, there are many others uh, that are occurring and maybe some of those will come up for discussion. Uh, we also just want to make sure that you have access to uh, information that we just reviewed in this uh, as we break now into uh, open discussion. I'll also point out there at the bottom of these slides, that is a link to the slides themselves, 
so that you can get all of these links uh, as well. So take a snapshot of the screen uh, and then you can get those slides uh, for following up on any of this material. Uh, but for the rest of the time that we have, uh, we can uh, do open discussion uh, and address some of the additional questions that have come in. So uh, Tim, you have particular questions that have uh, arrived that you want to tackle? Sure, yeah, there's one I just answered. It's a great question um, about, you know, do we think there's artificial intelligence um, algorithms that could be used to obtain objective assessment of papers methodological quality? It's a great question because the, yes, we're trying. <laughs> um, I linked to a preprint of the SCORE program that you should check out. That's very related to it. And there's a couple um, organizations as well that are trying to do that as well in terms of um, you know, basically developing algorithms that can try to do objective assessment. It'll still, and this is I think a, a, a tangential area to go, but a good one to think about, which is it gets back to what Brian was saying, which is you know, what else can you start to look at that gets at the um, uh, kind of assessment of quality, right? So this is where you're getting closer to like, not just openness, but like trying to hunt into rigor. Um, and then obviously if you wanna do like reproducibility or replication, you go farther and farther and more and more resources are there. But I do think, you know, development of tools is a, a great idea. Um, so I'm glad someone raised that because the connection is, is a good one. Great. Thank you, Tim. Anybody that would like to ask a question live, feel free to raise your hand uh, and we will uh, enable your talk. Um, or if you wanna type into the Q&A or the chat, uh, you can do that as well. Um, Martin asks, could the registered reports model work with observational studies? Uh, yes, and in fact, there are many registered reports that have been done uh, with observational research, including research with existing data. So I'll give one example is a project uh, called the AIID project, uh, made available a, a small sample of a very large data set looking at attitudes and identities and individual differences. That's psychological research. Um, and that small sample of data was made available publicly for anybody to do exploratory analysis uh, of different kinds of questions that they would like to investigate. And it was explicitly linked to a partnership of uh, a dozen or so uh, journals that were, uh, that explicitly said they'd be interested in it in reviewing registered report proposals based on this data set. And so what authors could do is develop their stage one registered report proposal on this existing observational data, submit it to one of those journals. And when the journal accepted it, uh, it for the ones that got accepted, uh, the managers of the data set would make the confirmatory data set available to the authors. And then they would write up their, uh, they would, you know, just rerun their script that they used to generate their exploratory findings and then put the confirmatory evidence uh, into the paper and submit the paper back to the journal. So there's a lot of interesting models, especially for data that is sequentially released uh, for secondary data analysis or for one's own generated observational uh, data uh, to be able to leverage the register report to try to improve uh, research rigor. So thanks for that uh, question. Yeah, and I just added the link there for anyone who wants to dive, dive in a little bit deeper. There was an the open call, the AID, AID project that Brian described. Uh, it's obviously a Google Doc, so you can kind of look at that in a little more detail. Um, Brian, I'm going to let you answer this one. There's a question there about what changes have you noticed? I think Alondra asked this um, in editorial policies related to pre-registration protocols and the publication of negative results. It's a good question. Uh, there have been some changes over time uh, and they, uh, in the broader sense of adoption of the top guidelines. So if you go to cos.io slash top, uh, this is a policy framework for journals or funders or institutions to promote greater transparency and rigor in the research that they publish or fund or support in their institution. Uh, and the adoption of pre-registration as interest by a journal or requirements, likewise publishing negative results, is increasing across journals, but increasing more slowly than some of the other areas of open scholarship. For example, engagement with open data or open code or open materials, protocols, et cetera, uh, has grown much more rapidly across journal disciplines 
then has pre-registration particularly and commitments to reporting negative results. There are a number of journals that are sort of leading lights on that. You know, PLOS One uh, was founded on the principle of we don't care about the importance uh, of the results. We're going to report, uh, we're going to publish papers based on their rigor and the questions that they ask, uh, not those uh, whether the outcomes are positive or negative. And there are a few others uh, that have explicitly promoted that approach. Uh, but the but that is not catching up as quickly as commitments to open data uh, and otherwise. The registered report mechanism gets there by default because suddenly you are publishing negative results because a lot of them are negative, it turns out. Uh, but uh, it isn't an explicit policy uh, statement about wanting to publish negative results in the standard form. The fact that there are now almost 300 journals that offer uh, register reports is a positive signal and it's starting to diversify across disciplines uh, that uh, this will become more acceptable practice over time. Thanks for that question. Tim, any other ones that you're seeing? I don't see anyone else. Yeah, if anyone wants to raise their hand and, and say something, feel free. Um, I'll just I'll add one just comment just to because um, I think it's some of these have been really good at kind of push also like the boundaries of where we're going on, on studies. The registered report RCT proposal that Brian was describing and shared on the links there so you can look at it. And one, please give feedback. I'd love to hear that um, just to kind of improve that design. Something that we did um, to help understand that and especially within this disciplinary boundary that we were just talking about is also to do a survey to ask people about that hypothetical revised resubmit registered report study. Um, kind of trying to get an understanding of like, well, you know, there's tons of journals that are doing this. Would the authors of those journals actually be open to that? Um, and what we found is that that we, at least in terms of what people are, are willing to say of this uh, hypothetical study, that they do that. And I think that's actually really helpful because what we're trying to get ahead of in, in terms of designing these studies, I think like everyone else is trying to understand where those biases are going to creep in. Um, I think, again, unless you have ultimate control over everything, like the hypothetical, Brian, that you described of we will pick labs, fund them, and they must do their research a certain way. Um, and, and that's just the way it has to be. We'll always have these kind of, uh, you know, moderating effects that influencing what we observe. Um, so it is really interesting to think about it. And again, that was something that went really heavily into the design of the matching of the, the articles in this registered reports project was thinking very heavily about that. Um, so I just want to highlight that because I think that was a, um, a nice second mini study to get into a proposed project. Um, but I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that when they read that RCT. Maybe they can send those back to us or add them to the notes. Yeah, great. And then I did see one more question in the Q&A that we didn't answer. That's an excellent question uh, about the, this study. And it's uh, when investigating how registered reports influence publication bias, does it include all reports or only those that end up being published? Uh, for example, do authors tend to follow through and publish all the results? Or might there be some risk that null findings still get lost between the registration and final publication? This is an excellent question because it must be the case that that's going to occur to some degree, but we don't yet have uh, documented evidence of it occurring or how often it occurs. So there are two ways that it will play out. Uh, one should be addressed in the peer review process. And that is, I as an author said I was gonna do this. And then when I submit my stage two, I report something else. The, really the purpose of that second stage uh, is to hold me accountable to report what I said I was going to do at the outset. And if I'm not willing to do that, then the paper gets rejected and it doesn't get uh, to be published uh, because I'm not willing to do it. Uh, or for whatever reason, I'm unable to do it. Uh, the second is that the registration occurs, but I just never submit the paper as follow-up, right? I'm super committed to that, this particular finding. I put in a register report because I want the stamp of credibility, but then I don't get the results that I want. And I say, uh, we never finished the study. And I just, just never submit it, right? That would be still a problem for publication bias uh, in the system. There isn't yet evidence, or at least a lot of evidence. It may have happened on a singular anecdote. I, I actually don't know of any examples uh, where the findings had been suppressed, but it's going to happen. An obvious question will be how often does it happen uh, that uh, findings don't get followed through once they are conducted. So this will be an important part of the ongoing research about registered reports is to document uh, and identify ways to address these kinds of challenges. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Jim, too, I'm just going to, before you, you oh, yeah. keep answering, I have to go to another call at, on the hour. So I'm going to jump off and say thank you to everybody. Uh, and Tim will uh, take us home for the remainder of the questions. So thanks again. Great questions and discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, I was just going to add one more thing, and then we'll see if there's uh, any other questions. Um, I do see a couple more questions. Um, one thing I was going to add uh, onto what Brian was mentioning um, is, is, is this a really good question that was raised about, uh, you know, follow through, essentially. Um, I think that's a really interesting study in the sense that one of the other projects that I'm doing, the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology, we actually had that where we've had, both, interestingly, two things happen. One is a rejection of a registry report. Um, because of deviations that we had to do in order to execute it and the editors reviewers not believing it was it was done so that's an, that's one one way of doing it right which is that second peer review uh what happens why are they rejecting um if, if it's not done how much of it is on the author very much deviating how much is it still on interpretation uh, potential gatekeeping another related part of that is not just doing the study like brian was saying and then not submitting it that's obviously probably occurring it'd be interesting to study it but also maybe the study was never able to be done for some other reason. Um, again, like in the cancer biology project, that's happened to us, either resource constraints or uh, because they're replication projects, we couldn't we couldn't get the models to work. So we actually just put the brakes on the whole thing and, and thus there's nothing left to submit because we actually never finished uh, the study because we can never actually get the experimentation to work. So I'd be, it's a great question. It'd be really good to, to tease apart. And I'm sure there's more than just what Brian and I had said uh in terms of the possible landscape or, or universe of those those reasons the nice thing is is if we can make sure that those initial um stage ones are, are public someone can actually start to do that all right um let's see that looks like there's maybe a couple more questions i see um jackie asked a question how do registry reports fit in the culture change funding proposal you mentioned oh i think um hopefully Brian made that a little clear, um, the culture change uh, funding proposals, those, those kind of RTIs, they're largely fit as these maps between where a funder would have a call um, in terms of trying to encourage, say, replication research or publishing of null results um, or, or whatever that other kind of, kind of open rigorous uh, reproducible behavior that they're trying to do. And to encourage it, you know, not just, you can either make it a policy, everything we do must do that, um, you can have it where it's just a uh, reward. Okay, if you publish, uh, say, your null findings um, in a journal and you send it to us, we'll give you some monetary reward or something like that. A lot of the times, what we see is it paired with a with a journal or multiple journals uh, in terms of it being like a registered report opportunity. So replication uh, works really well for that. If a funder wants to call for having a lot of replication studies, um, mapping that and having it be a registered report with a funder uh, with a journal, that funder journal pairing is really powerful because it one kind of reduces the barrier of okay this can get published right replication research is hard to get published uh, currently outside of registered reports and the funder gets the advantage because it also means that it's going to find its way out there right they're not funding research just to have it be kept in a file drawer they're funding it to make sure that it gets out there and maximizes impact so i think that's a great question hopefully i answered that jackie um oh and then there's another question i'll answer um and again if somebody else wants to raise their hand i'll stay on for a little bit longer it says, how at scale can we identify registered reports in the literature? Is there a metadata tag or similar that says this paper is a registered report? Yeah, it's that's another very good question. So this is, again, I think where the technology is still catching up as registered reports become more common. Hopefully this starts to get improved the right way. Um, part of a, the way that we did it, and I know a lot of other people who have studied it, is um, there's a Zotero library that, uh, that we at the Center for Open Science maintain in our policy team. Um, to actually identify which ones are registered reports. So, you know, doing this with, within the editor community to try to say, can you tell us which ones are registered reports? Because most of them tag it, but it's not in the metadata yet. So ideally that finds its way over into something like Crossref. And I know there's been a lot of discussion to start making that um, more formal. Um, that gets you into the publisher realm. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. And I think once that becomes a, a format that you can search on such like review articles, um, that'll make the research on it much easier. But in the meantime, I think right now we're still leaning on it being a bit of a grassroots manual effort to make sure that we're curating um, which articles are registry reports um, and maybe even ones which ones are not because there's been in the past, I know, a couple of publishers that accidentally identified their article as a registry report and then had to quickly correct it and remove um, kind of that local uh, paper level metadata that they had on their site. So it's again a great question by by someone. Cool. I think I think I'm up to date with all the questions. Um, 
I want to thank everyone again for for staying on for the whole hour. Um, I'll wait just another minute, and then um, if there's no other questions, then I'm going to say thank you, and then I'll be on the lookout for when this um, gets published. The webinar will get published for for you to share with others who missed the missed today's discussion. All right, I think I think we've hit that point. So I want to thank everyone again for for joining me and Brian, um, and uh, be on the lookout for for more exciting stuff from registered reports in the future. Thank you.